Good morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the, the pastors here at Horizon. If we haven't had a chance to meet, it's great to have you in worship. We are overjoyed that if this is your first time here with us, we have been praying for you. The, the very heartbeat of who we are at Horizon is about connecting with those that are not here yet. And so we are so thankful that you are worshiping here with us this morning. Uh, we're uh, in a, the second part of a three-part series called Letting Go of Perfect. And uh, this was a, a series that I have to admit that Erica was really excited about. Um, I wasn't quite sure what this all meant, um, so uh, she started us off great last week, and uh, Tuesday, I, they often say Tuesday is the most productive uh, day of the week, and I was having one of those Tuesdays where I felt like maybe everyone else was being really productive, but I was just stuck in the mud. I, I had nothing, I, I didn't understand what I was supposed to do with this sermon, um, I, I'll be honest, it's not this like super special process. Like Erica works through a lot of these ahead of time and uh, it just literally assigned me something to preach on today. And I'm like, I'm glad that's meaningful to you, but I have no idea what that means. So hopefully God will speak. <laughs> and I'm just driving from one meeting to another. I was going uh, from a lunch meeting I had at Armature to a coffee shop in Seminole Heights. And I'm just at a stoplight and I had this feeling of my chest was getting tight. I felt like I wasn't getting anything done on most productive day of the week. And I began to think back to all those past failures in my life of where I didn't feel good enough, where I felt like an imposter. Um, thought about all those to-do list things that I had to get done to make Tuesday productive that I just wasn't getting done and it wasn't going the way I wanted it to go. And I realized very quickly that I was having trouble myself letting go of perfect on Tuesday. I wanted it to be just like I wanted. I wanted to check off things. I wanted to get things done. I wanted this to be an easy sermon writing process. And it was at that stoplight that, that Erica reminded me what we were working through right now, letting go of perfect. And I realized very quickly on Tuesday that, that I was getting in the way. God had called us here to this place with a vision of, of shining light, igniting change, so that there would be a new day in people's lives and in this community. And it was very much that there was not a new day in my own life on Tuesday. It was about me. God didn't call us to a, a perfect church here, but called us to be people that were making a difference, that were connecting to something bigger than ourselves, connecting to a God that gives us a purpose, a God that gives us a plan, that gives us meaning. And that's what we're about. It's not about being perfect. And so today we're, we're going to be uh, looking through a story in the Bible. Um, it's about Israel's first king. King Saul, and it's in First uh, Samuel. It, we'll be looking in verses or in chapters nine and ten today. Um, so, if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open it up. Um, we'll be working through both those chapters through a diff few different verses. And if you don't have a, a Bible with you, I invite you. To, um, one of the coolest things that that I use uh, fairly regularly is is the Bible app. Uh, I don't get any uh, commission off this, but seriously, download it. It's a it's a it's a great way to always have uh, a Bible on you. Um, you can make notes and highlight, and it saves it. It's, it's a cool resource, and so definitely check that out if you don't have a Bible. So if it, we'll open up um, to 1 Samuel chapter 9. And so, like I said, this is Israel's first king. Israel, um, at this point, had been, uh, been led by, by different leaders of, uh, called Judges. Um, but Israel kept looking around, and they kept seeing all the other nations that, that had, had kings. And they kept saying, God, can we just have a king like everyone else? We just want a king like everyone else. And so God finally relents and says, if you want a king, just let me have a little say in who gets to be king. And so that's what we're going to be reading today. This takes place about... Uh, 1040 BC, if, if you're into the timelines and dates. Um, so we're we starting off here at, at chapter 9, verse 15. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed the following to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the Benjamite territory. You will anoint him as leader of my people Israel. He will save my people from the Philistines' power, because I have seen the suffering of my people, and their cry for help has reached me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, that's the man I told you about. That's the one who will rule my people. 
And so right off the bat, we, we see this God's why in Saul's life. Saul is, is to be the king of Israel, to be the first king. And Samuel, the prophet, is going to anoint him. And just as soon as there's an announcement of this anointing that's going to take place, Saul begins to have questions like we often do, don't we? When we get a, a big task, we begin to question, why me? How could that be? And so here, Saul's response here in verse 21. But I'm a Benjaminite, Saul responded, from the smallest Israelite tribe. I'm from a tribe that has been decimated by civil war. How could it possibly be me? And my family is the littlest of the families in the tribe of Benjamin. My family is, is of no account. We're even disrespected among our own people. So why? Why would you say something like that to me? How could it possibly be me, Samuel? Me? How could I be king? Don't we, don't we have those own experiences in our lives when we're asked to do something big, bigger than we could have imagined? And we begin to say, it's not me. It's got to be someone else. There's someone else more qualified, someone else more experienced, someone else more knowledgeable. And we, we take that into our, our own identity. We begin to, to base all of our life on where we've grown up, how we've been educated, our family history, our own experiences. And it's Saul that says, I'm not a general. Every other leader of Israel at this point has been a warrior. I'm not that. Every other leader is in politics. I've never ran for public office. I don't have a degree in pol political science. How could it possibly be me? I'm from the smallest tribe, and my family's name doesn't matter. It's not me. You've got to have the wrong idea. And here's the thing. It's God that uses those imperfect people to accomplish God's why in our lives. When I was uh, in Nashville, it, it, it also can't be a Chris sermon if you don't talk a little bit about football. I, uh, I coached for three seasons at an inner city school in East Nashville. And it was probably the most joyful time and also the most challenging time. Um, I, I played football here at Plant. And I have to say, uh, football at an inner city school it was nothing like uh, my experience here at Plant. Um, we were still kind of in the dark ages. Uh, we literally got water breaks from a hose still. There wasn't fancy uh, water lift systems. And uh, in just those three seasons, I had three young men um, that were lost to gun violence. Two of them didn't even graduate before they lost their lives. And one of them died just over a week after graduating. It was a challenging situation. These, these young men, most of them lived in public housing. I learned that you, you don't say, you don't ask where, where someone lives, but you ask them where they stayed because where they slept at night would only be temporary. These young men had unstable family lives. It was noisy all around them. And uh, for three seasons, I was the, the head uh, freshman coach. And uh, our first season, we only won one game. And our last season, we, uh, we went undefeated. And we won the city championship. And I, it took a very different approach. Because I, I knew we could not necessarily just, just call the same plays that everyone else was running. Most often at, at practice, we would not even practice against a defense. We would not even use a ball. We had to, to visualize it. Because for all their lives, they had told when you get down a touchdown, you get down two scores, the game's over, you're behind, you're never going to get back ahead. That was their identity. They had seen everyone around them get behind and lose. And so why even bother trying? We practiced mindfulness. We centered ourselves to visualize what it might even be like to do something different. We had to realize that, yeah, we weren't perfect, but we could still accomplish great things together. It didn't mean we had to argue with each other on the field and blame each other. We were in this together.
accomplish his great things through our weaknesses. There is no such thing as a perfect life. There is no such thing as a perfect marriage. If you've been married more than two weeks, you probably know that. (laughs) There is no such thing as a perfect church. Y'all, the first Sunday we worshiped, we couldn't get the screen to work. I don't know if y'all, some of y'all might have been here. I mean, there was very few that first Sunday. And probably half our church that first Sunday was back behind here when we started at 10 o'clock. And we literally couldn't get wires plugged in right. There is no such thing as a perfect church. And there is definitely no such thing as a perfect pastor. Because we were standing up here going like, "Um, if you can bring out your cell phones and just Google the first song, you can find lyrics for this. We were embarrassed. And then... If you really want to know that there's no such thing as a perfect pastor, come on a Friday or early on a Sunday morning and help us set up. You will know that there is no such thing as a perfect pastor. (laughs) But here's the thing. It's so often that we measure our lives by our own perfections instead of God's unfailing love for us. And it gives us a why. It gives us a purpose and a meaning. And so when we keep reading it, in, in 1 Samuel of Saul's story here, starting in verse 10, or chapter 10, verse 1, Samuel took a small jar of oil and poured it over Saul's head and kissed him. The Lord hereby anoints you leader of his people. Samuel said, you will rule the Lord's people and save them from the power of the enemies who surrounded them. And this will be the sign for you. That the Lord has anointed you leader of his very own possession. God's given Saul a great task here. And he's anointed him. He said, this is what I want you to do. And if we skip down to verse 6, it says, Then the Lord's spirit will come over you, and you will be caught up in a prophetic frenzy right along with him. It will be like you've become a completely different person. When we start living God's why in our life and let go of perfection, we become a completely different person. That's what happens when God's spirit works in us. And when we begin to change, what happens? Well, there's those people that are around us. And sometimes those people don't like us to change. They want us to be just the same person we always have been. They want us to be maybe miserable just like them. And this anointing has taken place. And this is what happens to Saul. In verse 26, Saul also went back to his home in Gibeah. Along with him, went courageous men whose hearts God had touched. But some despicable people said, how can this man save us? They despised Saul and didn't bring him gifts. But Saul didn't say anything. So who are, who are these uh, despicable people? I, I, I think we could uh, joke that maybe they're just those yellow minions. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that's what it's talking about here. We know these kind of despicable people. They're the people that can kind of maybe complain all the time. They're, they're dragging you down. They don't want you to succeed. And yet there's a different kind of person that also surrounds Saul in this moment. And the scripture said that they are courageous people. If you're going to be king of Israel, you're going to need some courageous people around you. It's a big task. And and we know Saul is already having doubts that he was up for it. He needed some courageous people. Some people that were going to cheer him on. Even when there were people that said he wasn't worth it. That he couldn't lead them. There was going to need to be some people that were going to ask him those hard questions in love. Of Saul, what are you thinking? What are you doing? There were going to be those people that needed 
to actually pray for him. Not just say, we're praying for you, but stop in that moment and, and pray for him. Do we have courageous people in our own lives? People that are going to ask you, how are you really doing? You know, I ha- I've seen your wife here at church the last few weeks, but I haven't seen you. What's, what's going on in your life? Do we have those people in our lives that are going to surround us and ask us the tough questions because they love us? So who are you going home with? Are you going home with the despicable people or are you going home with the courageous people? Because for me, I've found out that life is too short. It's way too short to spend time worrying about what those other people think of us. I need courageous people around me. And I have to say, I have one of the most courageous person in my life. I have Erica has stood with me through so many things. Uh, I have to think back to when I, when I first was exploring this call to ministry, this great why in my own life, I was like, yeah, I would love to, to work at a church to experience what it might be like. And so uh, it, for 10 weeks over the summer, I got sent to this rural church in, in this town called Pittsburgh, North Carolina. So it's uh, about 35 miles outside of Durham, North Carolina. And in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, there was a church that had two members left. (laughs) And so this was my task for the summer. And this is really where I became a guru of church growth. Because by the end of the summer, we had three people coming to worship. (laughs) And so we were there for the summer for 10 weeks. And I was given this task of literally growing the church. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with two people in their 80s. And we're in a rural area. So they're like, there's not like houses. Like, you know, just along the road every, you know, few feet. And for that summer, I had no idea what to do. I felt like a total imposter. I was way overwhelmed with this task. But I had someone that was a courageous person that cheered me on every day. When I walked the country road knocking on doors and just introducing myself as the pastor, Erica didn't think I was crazy. Everyone else probably did. But it's what I had to do that summer. When I stood in front of two people and preached a sermon on Sunday, there was three sometimes because Erica would be there. She was a courageous person in that moment in my life when I was saying yes to a call, yes to this why. And we got to have some courageous people around us. We can't just have the despicables. We can't have the complainers that want to drag us back down and into misery. So God has called you, God has anointed you, God has given you a why. And for Saul, that why is so clear. God says, this exactly is what I want to do in your life. And yet even for Saul, who had this very clear idea, he resisted it. Hear this. So Samuel is about to kind of have this great, it's almost like a gender reveal in some ways. He's this big revealing of, of who the king is. So he brings all the tribes together of Israel. So he brought all the tribes forward, and the tribe of Benjamin was selected. Then Samuel brought the tribe of Benjamin forward by its families. And the family of Matri was selected. Samuel then brought the family of Matri forward, person by person, and Saul, Kish's son, was selected. But when they looked for him, he wasn't to be found. There's this huge moment of, this is going to be the next king, and then Saul's nowhere to be found. So they asked another question of the Lord, has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes. He's hiding among the baggage, the supplies. Isn't that what we do? We hide out. And I I think it's funny that this word supplies can also mean baggage. Because I have to think back to uh, a a sermon a few months ago that Erica did. If you you missed out, I hope I can find a video and share it with you this week. Um, So Erica had, had carried this bag 
takes this backpack around with like four or five bricks in it. And she did not volunteer to do it again this week because it was a little, it hurt her back a little bit. It was a little heavier than she expected. Uh, but I think it's funny that this, this, this idea of, of baggage, of, of what we carry around with us, comes up again here in this story. So often in our lives, even when we have a clear idea of what we're supposed to do, we, we get held back by our own baggage. What are those things that, that hold us back, that, that keep us from stepping out in faith? I think more often than not, the first thing is just fear. It's fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of what could happen, what might happen, what probably should happen. I think that's why Jesus says so often, do not fear, for it is I. When the angels show up, when God's about to do something big, folks fear. I think other reasons why we don't step out, sometimes it's just time. We feel like we've said yes to so many good things that we begin to be confused about even what our priorities are. That we don't have time to do this new thing that God is calling us towards. Or sometimes it's just timing. Life gets in the way. Maybe next year I'll think about doing that when I get these things in order. Or my kids are in school. Or when my spouse graduates. I'll do it later. Sometimes it's just the lifestyle. We don't want to give up something to do what God is calling us to. Sometimes they're just the task itself just feels so overwhelming. And I, I think that's where Saul is. It was such a big task that he didn't want to accept it. He wanted to hide out, wanted to be worried about. He wasn't good enough. He was worried about what other people might think. And so he runs. He runs and hides among the baggage. For some of you, you've known me for a long time and... My own life, my own calling to be a pastor was something that I, I struggled with all of those things. I was worried about I wasn't good enough. I didn't have the right education. I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know enough Bible to be a pastor. If you know me, I, I'm definitely an introvert. So standing up in front of people is not rank high on my things I like to do every week. Um, those fears can creep into my own life. But because God surrounds me and he's given me a why and he supports me in that and I surround myself with courageous people, I'm able to make it work. And here's the thing. There are absolutely more qualified people to be the pastor of Verizon. There's more gifted speakers. There's more gifted administrators. There's more gifted pastors. But that doesn't matter at the end of the day. I've got to live into the why that God has given me. God says that it's through our own weaknesses that God will do something great in our lives. We've got to get out of hiding. We've got to let go of those that are trying to bring us down. God has anointed you. God has called you. God wants to do something amazing through your life. Pray with me. God of creation, you spoke and brought forth life. God, you are speaking into us right now, stirring us to be people that live into the why that you have given us. For some of us, that is in our workplace, that is at home, that is in our families, that is in this community. We pray that you would move through us today to be people that courageously take a step to live into our why, to let go of being perfect because you know that we are already not perfect, but yet you call us to the work. You call us to be people who love you and love one another. And we can do that. pray this in Christ's name.
Amen.